Uh, mine is to welcome all the participants and the panelists to this afternoon uh, webinar. Uh, so introduction, my name is Victor Juma, Business Manager for Syngenta Professional Solutions. I um, also want to acknowledge our participants from uh, the entire South African region and other regions listening to us this afternoon. And as a follow-up to our previous webinar on application technology, our focus today is on TRIPS uh, management. Uh, we have speakers all from Syngenta and Dudutech. Uh, from Blue Tech, our panelists are Mr. Elijah Getiro, uh, Group Agronomist, Flamingo Produce, and Blue Tech IPM Solutions. We have Mr. John Ogecha, Training Manager, Blue Tech IPM Solutions. Uh, from Syngenta, we have Mr. Marcel Hubas, uh, Technical Manager for the region, and also responsible for stewardship and sustainability. And we have uh, Daisy Ngeno, our Technical Manager for East Africa. Uh, also to acknowledge the Syngenta team present, we have uh, Kennedy, we have Daniel, uh, Geoffrey, and Biruk from uh, Ethiopia. And also the Zoo Tech team, we have Mr. Barna Barotich, uh, Mr. Ian Mitchell, and uh, Mr. Corey Smith. And I would like at this point to ask that if you have any questions, uh, please post them on the Q&A section, and not on the chat section. And uh, we shall try our best to tr answer all the questions after the presentations. Uh, if you have any technical issues, please also post it on the Q&A. And finally, uh, just inform me that you are recording the webinar uh, for purposes uh, of training those who are not able to join in today's call. Uh, thank you very much. And I would like to welcome our first speaker, uh, Mr. Elijah Getiro. Most welcome, Elijah. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, uh, Syngenta, for organizing for this very important webinar on the challenges farmers are facing regarding thrips in their roses business. And for us to appreciate the pest status of thrips in the flowers industry, it will be necessary for us to go through get to paint a picture of what the flowers by, by extension the roses industry is. Uh, we look at the status of the roses industry in Kenya, the status of thrips in the roses or flowers industry in Kenya, damage analysis, and then after that we look at the challenges the ornamental growers are facing in so far as thrips management is concerned. We start by looking at the question posed by Syngenta. Have growers reached an impasse regarding the management of Western flower thrips? I don't think so. And I believe that by the end of this webinar, we'll have gotten some insights on ways to manage them in the flower business. Next slide, please. And uh, yes, as I've already indicated, we need to appreciate what the flowers or ornamental industry is in Kenya. As of 2019, the total area under flowers in Kenya stood at 4,000 hectares, of which 3,500 hectares falls under roses. And according to the 2019 Kenya Flower Council export statistics, which is obtained from HCD, we exported a total of 126 million kilograms of roses, which translates to 3.5 billion stems or 10.12 million stems every day. And this accounts for 80% of the flowers exported from Kenya. And in this roses industry or flowers industry in Kenya, we have 160,000 direct employees and for every one employee, it's estimated that there are five indirect employees, which translates to 800,000 employees in the flower business. That's how important the flower industry is to the country of Kenya. Next slide, please. And for us to appreciate the trips in the flowers business with special emphasis on roses, Thrips account for 20 to 30 percent 
of the entire agrochemical bill. Next slide. A bit of statistics, total average agrochemical expenditure on roses varies between 1.2 to 2 US dollars per square meter per year, depending on which part of the country you are operating in, whether you are incorporating IPM or you are on conventional systems of thrips control only, I mean, uh, crop protection. And of these, total expenditure on thrips varies, ranges between 20 to 30% of the chemical bill, and this percentage is increasing. And when we talk of the successful story of IPM in the flower industry, most of the time we are referring to the successful story of phytocillus. And I want to believe that by the end of this webinar, we'll incorporate, we'll get insights on biological solutions for thrips management. Next slide, please. As already indicated, there are no advantages in terms of thrips incidences between the low and high altitude uh, rose production regions of Kenya, be it in Nairobi, Naivasha, South Rift, North Rift, Mount Kenya region. There's no single region, there's no single farm you can visit and fail to get thrip investigations. So it's a headache to every rose grower in the country. And I want to believe that not only is this a challenge in Kenya, but the international audience will also attest beat Ethiopia, Uganda, South America, Holland, thrips is an emerging pest. Next, please. And to confirm, of the thrip species, the Western flower thrips, Franklinella occidentalis, is the most prevalent in the roses business. It has got six stages, of course, starting with the egg, which is laid on the rose bushes. First and second larval instars found on the rose bushes as well, especially the red shoots, followed by the prepupa and pupa found on the media. If you are doing hydroponics, it could be on pumus or in the soil, if you are on soil cultivation, and then the adult, which is found on the flower. Next slide, please. And therefore, having gotten the above picture, the following is the list of some of the challenges rose growers face in so far as thrips control, thrips management is concerned in the rose industry. The, but the first challenge is thrips are polyphagous. Poly means many, phagous means plant feeding, which means they have got alternate hosts. You sort out the thrips, resident thrips in the greenhouse. Some will come in because they are migratory, brought in by wind currents. So we have got a feature cycle. Number second, two challenge is the voracious, which means they are aggressive feeders. When once they attack your rose crop, you can only see damages, especially on the petals. They are a thigmotactic. Thigmotaxis refers to insect response to touch. Positive if they love the touch. Negative if they don't love the touch. Thrips love being touched and therefore they keep on hiding, cryptic lifestyle, and therefore that's why they like hiding within the flower petals where, or greenhouse crevices where they can always be touched by surfaces. They have got a high reproductive potential. One three female lays between two to seven eggs, which translates to 150 to 300 eggs in a lifespan of 30 to 45 days. This is further enhanced by the fact that they have got both sexual and asexual reproduction. Asexual means they don't want to be mated for them to lay eggs. They are also have a short life cycle, completing a life cycle within seven to 14 days at a temperature of 26 to 29 degrees, which is an environment found in the greenhouse. 
Another challenge is the Adano feeding habit. Thrips will come from the rose flower buds between 10 and noon, and then hide, and then only to come out in the evening between three and five, which poses a challenge that we shall see in a short while. Next slide, please. Another challenge, and we'll be happy to get growers' comments on this, is resistance to various pesticides available in the market. Not all products that are available give us positive results once applied. This is because of the phenomenon of resistance. Global warming means the climate change, temperatures are rising, and that helps the thrips complete their life cycle much faster than before. Thrips are also known to be factors of viruses and tosporviruses. If you grow chrysanthemums, thrips are responsible for the spread of the tomato spotted wheel virus. If you grow impatience, impatience mosaic virus, and also in Alstromerias, they are known for spreading tospor viruses. We don't grow the flowers to consume them locally, we export them, and the markets have got base codes and therefore market restrictions on what to use and what not to use. This poses a challenge to the farmers as to the range of products available for them to control thrips. In international trade, National Plant Protection Organization, SCAFIS for Kenya, KCB for Holland, they don't want to see thrips. Some of them are regulated. The Franklin L. Occidentaris Western flower thrips is a regulated pest. Others are quarantined, like the thrips palmi, the cucumber thrips. Next slide. All this means that the cost of production, courtesy of one notorious pest, is not remaining the same. It is increasing. Another challenge is the performance of control tools, be it chemical, biological, there are no silver bullets. Another challenge is the MRL. The group Pokemon, which comprises the Swiss Corp, Reve in Germany, Omniflora, and the Penny have given us a residual ceiling of 10 actives at any one given sampling. Little was meant to announce in April this year that their ceiling will be six. This will pose a challenge or poses a challenge to the growers as to the number of actives they can use in their production. And then finally, the spray technology. We've seen thrips have got a done our feeding habits. And therefore the question is, what time of the day is best to spray against them? Is it the morning? Is it before they come out or after they have come out? Syngenta also took us through on spray water volumes. Do you spray the petals only, the flower buds only? Do you spray the entire bush? or the bush plus the shoulders of the beds where the roses are growing. Nozzle type, pressure, coverage, name it. I mean, as we talk, the number of actives we're using in production is declining. In the 90s, early 2000, we used to use actives like fipronil, methiocarp, methamyl, Oxamil, which have since been phased out. We've got restrictions on the use of neonicotinoids, acephate, thiocyclam, lambda. That narrows the range of actives that a farmer can access to produce roses. IPMs, we leave that to our Professor John Tutako. Next slide, please. 
And therefore, with all those myriads of challenges the rose grower is facing, the question they are asking is, is there a way out of thrips management? The maximum from us all is the way in is the way out. We propose an integrated approach, embracing cultural, fiscal control, biological control, and the use of benign green chemistry in the effective management of thrips to get a clean flower for the export market. And with that, I wish to hand over to John Ogesha to take us through biology and control of thrips. Thank you so much. Thank you, Elijah, for that wonderful presentation, laying the groundwork for the subject of the day, and that is thrips. As usual, you do justice to an overview of the industry and the thrips challenges, challenge as it were. So my name is John Nogecha from Dudutech. As Victor had mentioned earlier on, I want to mention that I have another number of colleagues joining in also in this webinar. One of the panelists is Bana Barotich. So we are doing this together with the Syngenta group. So mine would be to briefly talk about two key areas. I'd like to highlight thrips biology, linking with what Elijah said and with the implications on management mainly. And secondly, I would like to look at what are the biological control options that we have at our disposal for the management of thrips. Next, please, Liz. So this is an overview of uh, my presentation for today, which should take around 15 minutes maximum. So we want to look at thrips, what they are, look at the biology, then I'd look at what are the management options at our disposal, cultural, physical, and then I'll end it by looking at the biological options as well, under which we want to look at predators, entomopathogenic nematodes, and fungi. The world over, these are the three groups of biocontrol agents that are used in thrips management. So we'll be highlighting that at the end. Next, please, Liz. So if you could dive straight on to thrips, what are they? So thrips belong to the insect group called Thysanoptera. It's an order, really. So in, when you are classifying insects, the order are based on the uh, wing morphology or the wing structure. So that name Thysanoptera simply means that the wings of thrips are like eyelashes. They have a stalk and then the hairs grow out of it. At least if you can play the video on the right, on the bottom right, there's an adult thrips and you'll be able to, the viewers will be able to see what I'm talking about, the wings of thrips. Then thrips are the smallest winged insects. Unfortunately, small, but causing a lot of damage. And a bit of semantics, a bit of language issues. There's no such thing as trip. Many times I talk to growers and they say, you know, trip is a problem. There's nothing like trip. Correct English should be trips, whether it's one or whether there are many. More seriously, we have more than 6,000 species of thrips worldwide. It's such a diverse group, including some that are even used in biological control, as I'll mention earlier, later on. But out of the 6,000 species, 100 species have been recorded to be pests of crops that we are growing, out of which the damage costs is estimated to cost $10 billion worldwide on an annual basis. So we are talking about a, a small insect that is really destructive. Next, please, Liz. So talking about pest strips, which is our focus for today. Most of the pest strips belong to this family called Tripidae. Again, Tripid is a diverse group, including some that are feeding on spider mites and not feeding on crops, as you can see the third last point. But I'd like to draw your, our attention to 
two main genera in this group 3PD, and that is thrips and Franklinella, the second last point. So straight away, when you talk about thrips, there's a genus called thrips, like thrips tabakai, the onion thrips, or Franklinella. We have here of Franklinella occidentalis, what we love to call Western flower thrips. And we also love to hate it the most on our flowers. And talking about the Western flower thrips, you can briefly highlight on that. It's called the Western flower thrips because it's an import from the Western side of America, the Western coast, hence the name Western flower thrips. It originated from the Western coast of the USA. Currently, thrips experts are warning us that there's an Eastern thrips again, Eastern flower thrips coming from the eastern side of the USA again that is spreading worldwide, Franklin electricity. So there's a warning that that is also spreading all over the world. Next, please, please. So how is the life cycle of trips? Elijah has mentioned something on this. I would like, just like to highlight issues that I think have implications for management. So like Elijah mentioned, trips has six developmental stages ranging from egg up to adults. The eggs are laid underneath the epidermis. It's actually inserted into the tissues of the plant. Thrips has a soul like ovipositor. Ovipositor is that organ that they use to lay eggs. So it actually lays its egg inside the plant. Take note, inside. So Elijah mentioned something about cryptic. So the, the hiding starts from the eggs. The first instant nymphs that hatches from the egg loves to live inside the very tight spots. If you remember the word tigmotactic behavior that Elijah mentioned earlier on. So they like hiding in the very tight spots inside the flower buds. Or if you have leaves, those unopened leaves, that's where they like to hide. The same case with the second instant nymph, it molds the second instant nymph, still hiding inside the flower petals. The prepupa is the next stage. This stage drops to the ground. So pupation takes place up to five millimeters below the soil surface or below the media surface, whichever media you're using. So that's where you find the pupa and the prepupa. So if you're following me, you'll realize that all those stages, there's no stage that is easily accessible. And that has serious implications for management of trips. The adults is what comes out of the soil or the media for that matter. And they love to stay inside the flower buds again. Elijah mentioned that they are diurnal, they come out during the day. So what comes out really most of the time are the adult stages. The nymphs would spend most of their time inside the flower buds. To worsen the case for management, thrips also have a very rapid life cycle. Egg to egg can take between one week to two weeks, seven to 13 days. And if you're talking about resistance development that Daisy is going to talk about later on, you find that resistance develops very fast in insects that have the, such a short generation time. Next, please, please. So just still highlighting on the life cycle, Remember, I've said virtually all these stages, there's none that is easily accessible, and that's why management is a bit of a challenge. So there are stages that you'll find in the soil, there are stages on the plant, I think I've highlighted that. So the pictures on the right indicating the different stages. So the very small one at the top is the first insta, the second insta, and the adults. Those are the stages that you'll find on the plant, represented here by the green part of the, of the, of the, pie, of the, of the pie chart. Then the prepupa and the pupa. The one on the left is the prepupa when the wing buds have started developing. Then you have the pupa when the wing buds, the wing, the wing buds have already elongated. Next, please. So if you are to talk about the generation time for trips, this is a very ideal scenario that is not likely to happen in nature, but it serves to highlight what we are talking about, the exponential capability of trips to develop. So if you're starting with one thrips eggs, assuming it's a female, given the biology that we just talked about, within 12 weeks, we could be ending up with 85.75 trillion eggs, if every condition is perfect. 
which of course nature is not perfect, but it just gives serves to highlight the fact that trips are able to develop very fast within the greenhouse if the conditions are right. Next, please. So what damage do trips cause? The damage that is caused by trips comes about due to their feeding behavior. If they're feeding on the petals, there'll be direct damage. If they're feeding on the petals or the leaves, wherever they are, there'll be direct damage and indirect damage. So talking of direct damage, trips have piercing and sucking mouth parts. Again, for a long time, literature has told us that, you know, trips has rasping mouth parts. They rasp and they, they suck the sap. It's not very true. They actually have piercing and sucking mouth parts. They pierce the individual cells and suck the contents of the cells. So what you see as a discoloration of the petals or the leaves is as a result of the dead cells that have been filled up with air and that's what appears as white or off color on the petals that we observe. Next, please. So still on direct damage, it will be something similar for the leaves again or the green parts of the plant. If you look at that leaf on the top, I think that's chrysanthemums. It looks quite like mite damage. The difference between trips, the critical difference between trips and mite damage, trips typically would start from the margins of the leaves going inwards, while mites will always start around the mid ribs or the mid vein for that matter. Next, please. So, in terms of indirect damage of trips, the vector, a, a genus of viruses that we call tosporviruses. There are a number of them, but the key most important ones are the two that are highlighted, tomato spotted wilt virus, and you also have impatience necrotic spot virus. So this is the group that we call tosporviruses. For a long time, we've always believed that these viruses only affect solanaceous plant. From my reading, it's recorded that these viruses have been recorded in more than 80 families, not just Solanaceae, and they affect more than 800 species. So even for us rose growers, we need to watch out. Maybe very soon it, we could find this virus on our crops as well. Then apart from the virus vectoring, they also passive vectors, passive carriers of fungal infections. I think if you talk to any grower, they'll always associate trips with the botrytis. And for a good reason, trips cause those injuries on the petals that act as entry point for the fungal infections, as well as bacterial infections or secondary infections for that matter. Then also to mention some trips are notifiable pests. A good example here is another trips genus called trips palmi, which is not acceptable in the, in the, in the EU where most of us are exporting our floricultural produce. Next, please. So as we come to the end of this, how do we manage trips then? I want to start by an admission that trips management is challenging for a variety of reasons that have been highlighted by myself and earlier on Elijah. But like Elijah, I would have to go with him and say that we have not really reached an impasse. I'm an optimist, just like we trounced red spider mites. I believe if we do the right things, we can trounce trips as well. So and I'm an optimist. As an optimist, I go by the saying by one of Africa's greats. The next slide, please. Nelson Mandela. I always remember this quote. After climbing one great hill in life, we only find that there are many more hills to climb. So life is continuous challenges. And I believe without challenges, life would not be interesting. So in growing, likewise, we don't expect easy solutions. We climb hills and new hills come up, trips, FCM and the likes, and we have to keep climbing. The question is, do we have the necessary arsenal to keep climbing? And that's why we are coming together to present such fora in an attempt to develop and come up with solutions. Next, please. So the way out of trips management, just like with red spider mites, we can't rely on 
the solutions as Kenyan growers, we like to say, I think I've attended many seminars that growers always, would always ask, so what is the solution of this problem? We don't have the solutions, but rather we have a combination of solutions that should be used together with the right knowledge to come up with a solution. So in terms of TRIPS cultural management, sanitation ranks high, like with any other pest. It's always recommended that you start clean, clean planting material, clean growing media, clean greenhouses. That's the starting point. And once you've started clean, we have to make sure that we stay clean. So where feasible, we could screen out the strips by using netting material that is very fine that trips are not able to go through. But for any grower, you'd realize that when you do that, the very fine netting would also compromise ventilation. So we need to find a way of optimizing ventilation within the greenhouse if you're going to go the screening way. Weeding, trips are polyphagous, to use Elijah's word, they feed on a variety of plants, not just the flowers. So make sure that you don't have anything that is flowering in and around the greenhouse. Then mulching is also another way, method, particularly covering the, the media so that the trips do not get access to the pupation site. Then there's been some interesting research also on mulching where we use UV repelling mulches just to confuse the trips so that they do, they do not land on the crop. That's an interesting research that is also coming up. Removal of debris and open flowers, like you can see on the right. So again, for the debris, we do so well in removing them from the greenhouse, but most growers have been to, you, you, they place them outside of the greenhouse in the open. So again, trips will realize that the thing is drying up and they'll fly back to the greenhouse. So it's always recommended that you keep them covered, either in a, wrap them in a polythene bag or have a drum that is you can close to keep them off from getting back. Then there's a controversial one on the bottom right. Avoid wearing blue or yellow clothing in the fields. We all know that yellow and blue attract flying insects. Blue particularly for trips. So if you're doing this, what these guys are doing, then you know we could end up spreading the problem even where it's not there. Then I also wanted to mention something on uh, repelling in the, in the times of staying clean, the use of repellents. And there's a good, a good product that is gaining a lot of prominence also, garlic extracts from Dudutech. It's called Nemgad. We have it for nematodes, but for some reason, guys realize that it repels trips very well. So when it's combined with pesticides, either through an application before the pesticide application or as a cocktail, then we tend to have more lethal effect on the trips. It kills more. When you're combining with sticky cards that I'm going to talk about next, you end up catching more because trips are agitated to come out from their hiding places. Next, please. Then next, I'd like to talk about mass trapping. Like you can see on the right, most of us are doing yellow or blue sticky traps that works against strips. For those of us who have been doing that, I have good results from a peer-reviewed publication that actually indicates that traps can go a long way in trips management. Mm. So if you look at the graphs from this peer-reviewed paper from Dr. Professor Kak and Samson, the graph on the left is looking at the population of trips that are found in the flower. And you can see four is the damage threshold, is the threshold that they're looking to keep the tree population below. So the, what this shows us is that simply by the use of traps alone, whether traps only relying on color or traps that are combined with aggregation pheromones, these guys were able to keep trips below the damage thresholds. This applies to fruits, specifically strawberries. So if you can do this in strawberries, straight away you can see that traps, trapping would have a huge impact in trips management, even in flowers. Then the one on the right is now gauging the damage that is caused by the pests. 
it would imply that if you, if you have fewer numbers of trips per flower as a result of trapping, then you're also going to end up with less damage, as you can see with the graph on the right again. I didn't, I, I read this paper and I didn't include another graph that actually shows that just by mass trapping, we were able to end up with more sellable fruits. So again, economic benefits derived directly from the use of traps alone. Next, please. Also very important in trips management is trapping, I mean, sorry, is monitoring. So two methods of monitoring, we can use color traps, yellow or blue. There was a question from the morning session. Blue tends to work very well for the clear polythene. Uh, that's current research that is also coming up. While yellow tends to work well against trips for uh, UV blocked polythene. So mostly what we use in the tropics, I think what is coming out is that yellow tends to trap more. Again, the best way is to try it out yourself and see what works best. But this is the research that is coming out recently. Then still on cultural control, environmental control is yet another method. Trips don't like it when the humidity is high or when the growing media is very wet. They don't like it. So overhead irrigation through showering, misting, would also go a long way in trips management. Next, please. Good, so that covers physical and biological, con I mean, physical and uh, cultural controls. So as I come to the end of my presentation, I'd also want to talk about biological control. This would be an important cog in trips management. And actually the whole idea of Syngenta and Dudutech coming together is the realization that we don't have silver bullets in trips management. We need to combine different methods. We can't succeed with biological control alone as much as I'm coming from Dudutech. We can't succeed with chemical control and that's why we are joining up with Syngenta. Neither can we succeed with cultural or physical. We need a combination of methods. So biological control would be I an mean, important weapon also in your trips management strategy. It will also help in overcoming some of the challenges that Elijah highlighted earlier on. Key one being resistance. You'll never hear of a pest developing resistance to biological control agents. Apart from the obvious effects also, biological controls are safe to the environment. So it's a very important method also in the management of trips. So I'd like to start off with uh, predators. If you remember in biological control, I mentioned three methods. We can use predators, we can use pathogens in the form of nematodes, or we can use pathogens in the form of fungi, what you call entomopathogenic nematodes or entomopathogenic fungi. So I would start off with a new kid in the block as far as predatory mites are concerned. And this new kid in the block, it's called Transeas montedorensis. Initially, it used to be called Amblyseas montedorensis. So again, some scientists believe that taxonomists are uh, some of the most idle group of scientists. So when they get tired of the name Amblyseas, they change it to Transeas. We have to live with it, unfortunately, they're the experts. So the name has changed to Transeas. Montedorensis. So Transeas Montedorensis was actually first discovered in Australia. It's a, a mite, a predatory mite, as I've already mentioned, that is that feeds on the young thrips, the nymphal stages that I mentioned earlier on, the first and the second insta nymphs that are found within the flowers. It's a very tiny mite, so it's able to get the the, the, the names from where from their hiding places in deep inside the flower buds. It feeds on a range of pests, so you're not only controlling thrips, you're also able to control mites, you're also able to control white flies. And when I talk about mites, I'm not just talking about red spider mites, I'm talking about a group of mites, including the roset mites and the other tiny mites that you find on the crop. They're able to survive even when the prey is in low densities. They're not only relying on trips and these other insects, they're also able to feed on pollen. They prefer warm conditions, but they're able to survive both in cool and warm conditions. 
as with any other biological control, we recommend that they are introduced earlier in the cycle so that they establish before they are overrun by pests. They work well preventatively as opposed to as a firefighting tool. Next, please. Still on predatory mites that are found, that are used on the foliage stages, we also have Amblyseas cucumeris. Again, the name has changed. It's now it's going to be called going forward Neosailus cucumeris. So it also fits on the young nymphs, particularly the first insta nymph. Best used before the pest establishes. It prefers cooler conditions. And if you have a crop that will have a source of pollen, the better for you. It establishes very fast when you have a crop that is rich in, uh, in pollen. Next, please. The last one I'd like to talk about under this foliage predators is Amblyseas swirsky. Again, it's another Amblyseas. It feeds on thrips nymphs. It feeds on uh, white flies as well. So you're not only controlling thrips. It's likewise also able to survive on low prey densities. And I dare say this group of uh, predators are also fairly resistant to most pesticides. They're not like your phytosillas, so they're quite hardy. They're able to survive when it's hot and also when it's, when it's cooled. And they're also able to survive a number of pesticides. Again, it is best for crops that have a lot of pollen, capsicum and the like. Next, please. So this particular slide is very important. We are now comparing these foliar predatory mites. How do they compare in terms of life history parameters? As I mentioned earlier on, this exciting mite called Transeus montedorensis seems to be towering head and shoulders above the rest. So it's generating a lot of interest for a good reason. And I want to mention just for your information purposes, as Dudu Tech, we do not want to be left behind. So we are actually in the process of developing Transeas Montedorensis for, the, for you guys, for, your, for, the, for the market, again, the strip. So as you can see, and these are peer reviewed papers actually, you can uh, refer, I think the, 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 the presentation will be shared earlier on. If you're interested, you can read these papers you could realize that Transeas montedorensis trounces all these other predatory mites in almost every parameter. Whether you're talking about the predation rate, the reposition rate, either on pollen or on trips, how the intrinsic, the intrinsic rate of increase, how fast are they able to multiply on the crop? We can see that it's performing really well. Next, please. So that is on the life history parameters. But how about in doing the real job? And the real job, of course, is managing trips. How does it compare with the rest? Again, these are peer reviewed papers. There's actually a reference. This is a paper that was published last year, 2019, by Dr. Labe. I think the, re the reference would be able to show in the presentation that will be shared later on. So if you look at the graph on the left again, if you look at the number of thrips that are found per plant, and you're comparing these four different Amblyseas mites or predatory mites for that matter, again, you can see that the graph below indicated TM, Transeas montedorensis. Transeas montedorensis is able to maintain thrips population very low on the plant compared to the controls and compared to the other mites. Are we able to find the mites on the plant after application? So in your scouting reports, your scouts should also be able to report whether they're finding natural enemies or not. So this is what the graphs on the right is showing. Again, you can see that Transeas montedorensis is coming out top. It's actually very visible, very much visible on the crop. And it's not just a question of visibility, it's also doing the good job as it's indicated on the graph on the left. Next, please. So still on predators, again, I'll take you back to the life cycle of trips. Remember we said that the pupil and the prepupil stages are found in the media, in the soil. 
So how do we take care of this critical stage as well? Victor will tell you that if you have to use a chemical, it may not make economic sense. So you'll have you'd rather have something that takes care of it than is able to multiply naturally. And that's where we have hypoaspis miles. Again, the name is changing. It's going to be a mouthful. Stratulilaps, schemitas. That is a new name. So again, we are sticking with the old name for now. So our brand is called Hypotech, Hypoaspis Miles. But the correct name scientifically now is Stratulilaps schemitas. It's a soil dwelling predator, as I've already mentioned. So it's actually applied to the media and is able to establish very well on a variety of growing media, whether it's the soil, pumice, coir, or coconut coir, and the likes. Again, it's best introduced earlier in the crop cycle. It doesn't like dry soils or dry media, neither does it like waterlogged media. So the humidity should just be right. It should not be too wet. It should not be too dry. And then you have the extra benefit of also taking care of the nuisance pests, the serrated flies, the fungus gnats, the soft flies. And for those of us who are doing chrysanthemums, it's also able to take care of your leaf miner, the pupil stage that is found in the soil and also the stages on the leaves. Not on the leaves really, but in the soil, sorry. Next, please. So that wraps up our predators. So as I come to a conclusion, I'd also like to talk about the pathogens and starting off with entomopathogenic nematodes. That big word simply means insect feeding or insect killing nematodes, nematodes that are able to kill insects. If you can look at the cycle on the right, that's how nematodes work. So here we have a product called Nematech S, S for Stenanema peltiae as indicated here. And that's basically the life cycle. It enters into the insect. It has a bacteria that it uses to kill the insect. And then the, it feeds on the bacteria that has multiplied within the insect. So a straightforward life cycle. Again, used correctly, we've been able to get very good results simply by the use of stenanema. And the goodness, stenanema is what you use and it stays working for more than a month. So it's, we've been able to record very good efficacy, not just on the pupil stages in the soil, but also on the foliar stages, the nymphs and the adults. If you do high volume misting or uh, sprenching, as we like to call it here, a spray that, is, uh, that gets down to the, to the media. So again, we need very high humidities. So our recommendation always, like with any other biological control, preferably apply late in the evening when the humidity is high and when the temperature is just right. Next, please. Finally, we also have fungi that can be used to control insects. We call them entomopathogenic fungi. A good example here is Buviria bassiana. Our brand is Buvitec. We also have Lecanicillium lecani, Lecatec. So this group of fungi are generally broad spectrum. They'll target a wide variety of insects. So as you can see, the picture shown there is Duviria attacking bugs or what you call heteropterans, causing what you call the white muscadine disease. At the end of the day, the insect dies and you have that white growth, fluffy growth growing from it. Best effective at very high humidities. Again, we recommend humidities of above 70%. Again, evening application would make more sense. Next, please. And that brings me to the end of my presentation. The key takeaway that I'd like us to go home with, there are no silver bullets. We have to do the work in order to come up with a solution that works. And the solution that works is not single solution, it's about combining different solutions. It's, an outbound, it's not about the solution, but it's about solutions in combination, and that's what IPM is all about. Thank you very much. Thanks, John, for the wonderful presentation. Uh, I think you set the scene very nicely uh, for this to take us to the other part of IPM management. So welcome on board, Daisy.
Thank you, Victor. So I will take you through the chemical control system of uh, thrips in ornamentals and also insecticide resistant management strategies against thrips. So welcome to the, to the for listening and questions. Next slide, please. Um, as I've as just mentioned by John, chemical control is part of the IPA management. And this sums up on how, what the grower would want, sustainability in crop uh, production. You need also to save on uh, money and also time and integrating all these procedures and in a more practical manner. Next slide, please. Uh, what are the importance of chemical control in, in thrips management? Uh, use of insecticide has offered the main uh, effective management strategy. This is due to low levels, uh, tolerance levels for Western uh, flower thrips, that is in ornamental crops, and also um, low damage tolerance to, uh, for tomato spotted wilt virus. So the important is that we also need to consider the good coverage and penetration. This is uh, enhanced with the use of medium sized droplets. Um, also the importance when you are considering using the chemical control, also consider rotation of different groups of chemical and insecticides. This is to reduce uh, uh, risk to resistance and an integrated approach where elevates the constant insecticide pressure and also reduce the development of insecticide resistance. Next slide, please. Um, in order to ensure that you are using chemical control effectively, uh, you ensure that there's rotation of this uh, different mode of action of this insecticide. This is, will uh, delay the onset of the resistance and also prolonged efficacy of the products in control of, uh, in this case, thrips management. And when you're using co uh, chemical control, you ensure also you include the use of the insect growth regulators uh, available for thrips larvae control. So what we have currently is the lufenuron. And um, also in terms of application, the recommended you make at least two application at five day intervals. This is what will ensure that there is reduced population of the, of the thrips and also uh, gather for overlapping generations of the Western flower thrips. So also when you're use, uh, considering using also chemical control, ensure that you also check on the compatibility of the products to other products that are available. We also talk about the biocontrol, adjuvants, biostimulants, and also fertilizers. And um, also ensure that you read and follow the label in instructions. So this is very important. Next slide, please. Um, I will take you through some just examples of different chemical groups against thrips that are available. Uh, a few you can also see some of the products that um, are sy at Syngenta portfolio. So it runs from the natural light. You talk of um, organophosphates, pyrethroids, neocotinoids. Uh, next slide, please. You talk of, of uh, avamectins, the urea, carbamates, the IGR that I've just talked about, nerestotin analog, and also as a reduction, which is even as a, a known mode of action. So all these also are uh, in different error codes as uh, indicated, indicated just um, beside it. So next slide, please. There are also products that are registered uh, just in Kenya. Uh, with label recommended against thrips. So there are a wide range of the chemical groups, but you can see neocotinoids are the most uh, mostly registered for this purpose. Next slide. Um, and, as I mentioned, uh, I'm going to handle the topic on insecticide resistant management. That is very important, especially when you're doing uh, chemical control as they're part of the IPM program in controlling thrips. So uh, I, would, I would like us to understand what IRM means. This is a reduction of the selection pressure to insecticides. 
This is by, by doing what? By rotational use of insecticides and also minimizing the dosage and the number of applications you're using and also using these insecticides when only it is necessary. So over reliance on insecticides, uh, especially with the same mode of action, and can lead to development of resistance, even other than these products um, failing to control the Western flower trips in this uh, case. So what is the strategy for doing the eye insecticide resistant management? I've talked about rotation of the uh, uh, different mode of action insecticides. This is uh, will ensure there's uh, efficacy in control of uh, Western flower thrips, and also there will be no cross resistance with other conventional insecticides based on uh, we are using. So vertical integration is also very important in IRM, and uh, use of multiple and compatible tactics to control one group of pests. Next slide, please. Uh, why do we do this uh, resistance management? Um, resistance uh, to uh, insecticide has, has led to reduce effectiveness of this uh, insecticide in controlling the pests. This results in the loss of crop value in terms of quality and also yield, and also the loss of this insecticide because uh, the effect effectiveness has reduced. So what is the recommendation? You use the existing and new insecticide now with care and responsibility, bearing in your mind that there is a risk in, in, in development of resistance when you use the same mode of action insecticides. Next slide, please. So what are the factors that lead to the development of resistance? There are three main factors. Those are the pest risk, we have the chemistry risk, and we have the agronomic risk. All of these results to overall resistance and all of these factors, we are under control of them. So when you talk about the pest risk factors, what are they? Elijah has mentioned about the reproductive uh, rate of thrips, specifically in this uh, case, and also generation and seasonability of this pest, the behavior, the migration, we talk about the feeding behavior. Also, they have a wide host range. So those are the best uh, risk factors that are results, can result to development of resistance. In terms of the chemistry of the product that you're using to control uh, thrips, some of the factors you consider and you have control over are the insecticidal activity, residuality, and also the mode of action of that uh, product. It, what about the agronomic risk? We have the pest management practices that you have in place. And here we are talking about the I IPM and also the cropping system. All this contributes to the over of overall risk, uh, resistance risk. So next slide. Um, I, I would want to take you through um, mechanisms of resistance. We have two mechanisms of resistance, target site resistance, we have metabolic resistance. So in target site resistance is more just in, in this uh, illustration, we can see there is the change in structure of the target sites. And also uh, in the second uh, mechanism of resistance, that is metabolic resistance. This is where there's destruction uh, of the products of the insecticide. Uh, this, is, this is due to development of the natural detoxification enzymes inside the insect uh, metabolism system. Next slide, please. So uh, what are the agronomic practices that will help us prevent insecticide resistance when you're we de dealing with um, uh, chemical insecticides? One, we all know about, um, um, th these are the recommendations as by, by the IRAC, that is the Insecticide Resistance Management um, Action Committee. So we've talked about the um, IPM, practices where you are incorporating all these other practices and also considering, uh, most importantly, as John had, had mentioned, the uh, monitoring of the pest population and also be able to identify and know the life cycle of the thrips. Um, the second important practice that can help you uh, reduce um, insecticide resistance is the following the label recommendation. This will help you not to reduce or 
even increase the rates that are uh, from the recommendation label. Also just follow the recommended timing of application and also the number of application you are, you are working with. And use of the recommended spray volume is really important. So most importantly, but not least, also is just to know the mode of action and rotate this different mode of action of insecticide among successive generations. Next slide, please. Um, I will take you through an, uh, just examples where resistance selection happens and how does it happen when you use the same mode of action and what is the scenario when you use a different mode of action. So you have a pest population and uh, inside a pest population, we have the susceptible uh, varieties. And in this case, you are using the yellow color pest and also the pink color are the ones that are resistant. So when you expose this um, uh, population to one mode of action in say in the first generation, you find that there are resistant uh, uh, individuals that get to the next generation. And what happens in the next generation, if you expose to the, the same mode of action, it is going to reproduce and it, going forward, you can see the population of the pink, which are resistant varieties has increased with time. So also in the next slide, please. This is when now you are using the different mode of action across generation. The same population, you, 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 you use one mode of action in generation one, the resistant individual gets to the next generation, but now it's now exposed to a different uh, mode of action uh, insecticide. And you can see in the next third generation, you cannot stress the, the pink ones, which are resistant. By the time you are getting there and you're using different mode of action insecticide. So this one leads to reduced resistance selection with time. Next slide, please. Also, just to um, uh, illustrate, rotation of uh, different mode of action groups among pest generations. In the first row where you're using the same arrow, the same arrow shows that the same color of the arrow shows that the, that is the same mode of action. And you can see in the first row, we are using one mode of action product in the successive generation, even despite this in the first season and the second season. This is high risk to uh, resistance. And then the second one show the second row shows that there are, there are interrelation between the purple and the and the green, meaning that there are two products with different mode of action, but now you are using them within this uh, successive um, uh, generation. Now again, still um, successive generation exposed to the same mode of action, so we still have the risk of resistance. In the third row, where we are having different color. Uh, the purple and the green, but now in not in successive, successive uh, generation. That one, there's low risk of um, uh, development of uh, in, uh, uh, resistance. How about when you get to the fourth row? You can see there is alternating. Even within the generation, we have different mode of action you are using. Now, as, again, when you go to the successive generation, you are even using a different one. So this one, there is very low risk to development of resistance. So kindly consider using different mode of action, uh, even uh, not within, within generation and also, um, and, and then in successive generations. Next slide, please. So just uh, uh, an explanation of the treatment window where you're asking first pest generation, we have, you can have an example where you are having two applications per generation. But again, you can see the different colors of the arrow, even within the, uh, the same gen generation, you have different mode of action. And also among, just between generation, you have um, uh, different mode of action products. So that is a uh, good practice. And also the f an example where we are having even four application per generation. You can see with a different arrow setting showing that there are different mode of action within generation and also between a uh, successive generation in that season. So that is just uh, the same explanation that we are rotating different mode of action among treatment windows. That is a uh, good practice. Next. Uh, Syngenta has uh, insecticide resistant management strategies where we are having different mode of action products um, that you're using to control thrips. 
So still, these are, these are not the just the final ones, but we are also doing more research to just come up with the unique chemistry products that has a unique mode of action and also help you to, to manage uh, insecticide re resistance. So uh, I know we are quite familiar with all these other products and also different uh, chemical groups they belong and also how they, they, uh, they work and also they apply in different generations. Next slide, please. So this is a, a, just an explanation on how the Insecticide Resistance Action Committee. So uh, this is part of what we, they, they also ensure that you, this is a key, it's a dictionary to resistant management that you know every chemical group uh, where it belongs and you don't use the same chemical products in the same group. Next slide, please. So this is an example of where we are having group three, insecticide on trips management, and you alternate with group four, in, uh, insecticides. You alternate them with group six, insecticide, and you alternate also even with group eight. That way, you are able to manage um, insecticide resistance. And also at the same time, you are even having the products uh, able to control the, 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 the trips. Next slide, please. So what are the uh, main benefits from um, if we do an insecticide resistant management to the grower? One, you are increasing the product life. That means that you can incorporate uh, products in your spray program, which can be used. And also you can be able to, uh, growers shall be able to also save on cost and money and time. This is the in the num, there's no need for increasing number of application of an insecticide or rather the spray interval, reducing the spray interval. And also you have the more sustainable crop production. That means you have the less AI as also was a concern when Elijah talked about it. So this ends to a happy grower. Next slide. That uh, would uh, appreciate uh, insecticide resistance management strategies. Thank you for your time and thank you for listening. Uh, thank you, Daisy, for the presentation. And now over to Mr. Marcel Hubas to talk about sugars and trips control. Yeah, thank you, Victor. Um, as mentioned already before, uh, the number of options we have to control trips um, is more and more limited. Uh, due to regulatory challenges, but also due to challenges from the, from the market. And therefore, in, in our opinion, uh, every application has to be optimal. Um, and because of that, Syngenta has done a lot of work in the research to see how we can optimize the, the effect of insecticides against trips. One of the things is, of course, uh, application technology, where we already uh, talked about in the previous um, um, the webinar. Uh, and I would like now to focus a bit more on uh, the use of adjuvants and the use of liquor, uh, liquid sugars in, uh, in particular. The use of uh, liquid sugars is not new, um, especially here in Europe, it's, it's quite um, uh, commonly used. And it's already discovered by the Wageningen University at around the year 2000. There they found that with very low amounts of abamectin, uh, so the Dynamec, in combination with liquid sugar, the effect against trips was improving. Um, they only also found that it only works with the liquid sugars. The, the, our sugars that are normally used for bumblebee hives in uh, mainly tomato production or in fruit production. Um, and uh, it, it did, they couldn't make it work with other types of sugar. For example, the, the solid sugars that we use for coffee or tea. They also, they also found that it mainly works with products that um, act on the nerve system. And uh, within Syngenta, we also did some trials with uh, Match, for example, which is an IGR. And indeed, there we saw, didn't see any uh, added, uh, added value of sugars on, uh, on trips control. After Wageningen University found this effect, um, a lot of um, mode of actions are attributed to, to this uh, liquid sugar. And it's still not completely clear how it, uh, how it works and why it is improving some of the active ingredients. 
some of the researchers think that they uh, have a more attract and kill effect. Like we know, for example, with ants, if you combine their sugar with the chemical products, we know that the, the ants are attracted by the sugar. Something that think that uh, it stimulates feeding and increases nutritional in intake. So um, by, by stimulating the feeding, they think that there are more active ingredient into the, into the insect. Um, some think that it's in increasing the contact with the insect by just sticking to the insect, or that it uh, increases the intake and the consumption, consumption by cleaning. Uh, most of the insects try to wash off uh, dust and, uh, and other things from, from their uh, body. Um, and also some people think that it's the, the uptake of uh, active ingredient increases through the cuticula of the top cell layers in the, in, into the plant. Uh, again, so far the, the exact uh, mode of action is still not find, found and most probably it's in a combination of all factors. Within Syngenta, we've done uh, quite some research over the last um, year because um, we are launching in, in Europe and hopefully also next year in Africa products based on cyanotinilipril. And um, in, in Europe, we already launched uh, two years ago and um, this product will be, be launched in, in Kenya uh, next year um, with a strong, strong focus on TRIPS control. So therefore we did some research and one of the things we, uh, we checked is how is there a difference in spreading and drying time if you use uh, liquid sugars in combination with uh, the active ingredient. And here we saw under an electron microscope that there was no difference in drying time or in uh, spreading. But what we saw here is that the crystals from the active ingredient or from the product are covered by a film uh, as soon as they are combined with, an, with a sugar. So after drying, there was a difference. Um, however, also with the microscopy, uh, it showed that there is no difference in the form of the crystals. So it's only the way that they are covered with a, a kind of film. And there's also no difference uh, in the dissolv dissolvability of the, the crystals. They, they dissolve in the same way. So in these trials, we didn't see any evidence of uh, uptake enhancement or in differences in, in degradation. Uh, some other studies are also done. Uh, one was to, um, to demonstrate the, uh, the effect of attractiveness. And therefore we uh, did a selection test where TRIPS could choose between an area that was treated with sugar and untreated, but we didn't see any increase of consumption or attractiveness by, uh, by the sugar. And we also didn't see any uh, effect on, uh, on behavior, though we saw in all those trials that the liquid sugar, sugar improved the effect of the cyanotinity pole against strips. And one of the things we saw, this active ingredient is quite fast in, in acting. Uh, normally insects stop uh, within minutes. Uh, you have to think about 30, 40 minutes after the intake, they stop feeding. But in the combination with the sugar, we saw that it was even faster than without the sugar. The exact, uh, the exact, uh, exact effect behind this still has to be investigated. And what we also still need to investigate if there's indeed an, an effect of the sticky, stickiness of the, the sugar uh, so that the active ingredient better sticks to the, the insect. If there's a result in brushing or cleaning of the insect and if there's an influence on the, on the cuticula. So again, uh, we know that it works, but the exact mode of action is still not known. Um, to show the effect of the, the, the sugar, we have done uh, several trials. And in all those trials, we did two applications. And we, we checked the effect uh, three weeks until three weeks after the application. And here in this trial, you see the effect of Actara in, combina in combination with the sugar li uh, liquid sugar. And with Actara, we always have an, an effect of around 80 to 90% control in the combination. And in the second uh, bars, you see the effect of the cyanotinidoprol solo. And it's quite normal for us to see that the effect is around 40, 30, 40%. Then um, we did the sugar additives uh, solo, and there you see no effect at all. But in the combination with cyanotinidoprol, the active ingredient and the sugar, we see that again, we can increase the efficacy up to 80 to 90%. So 
So the liquid sugars uh, improve the effect on, uh, on mainspring uh, of, of the cyanotonic proton trips, and, uh, but the sugar itself has no effect. We compare this with other types of adjuvants, and that's what you see here in this trial. Uh, on the left hand side, again, the Actara with the liquid sugar, again, around 90% control. The Scientinidipol in combination, again, with uh, the 90% control. And then we tested two different types of adjuvants. And from both adjuvants, you see not, uh, th that they don't have that similar effect. The first adjuvant is a more organosilicon type uh, of product, which is more a spreader type of product. And the second adjuvant is a more oil-based product. So, so far with TRIPS, we only see the effect with sugar and not with other adjuvants. For other pests, of course, this is completely different. There, some adjuvants can have an additional effect compared to, uh, to others. Um, from practice, we know that most growers use about 0.25%. Um, for us, was the question, is that the optimal dose or is there a, a dose response? Therefore, we did an, um, a trial to um, look at the, the dose rates. And what you here see on the, the right-hand side of this graph is the cyanotonidipol in combination with 0.25% of liquid sugar, half a dose rate, and a quarter of a dose rate. And it's very clear here that with the, very uh, the lowest dose rate, the effect is less combined compared to the other ones. So the minimum dose rate of the sugar is 0.25%. One to five percent, uh, and we recommend a dose rate between 0.1 to 5 and 0.25 to have consistent results uh, during the applications. We also tested several um, different brands, and uh, you can see here the four bars on the right hand side sugar one, two, three, and four are different brands of liquid sugars. And there you see there is no difference between the different sugar brands. Um, as long as it's the liquid sugar that's used for bumblebee feeding, the effect will always be uh, the same. So in summary, uh, the liquid sugars can improve the effect of insecticides, but it only works with nerve acting insecticides. And it also only works with the liquid sugars, not with the solid, uh, not with solid sugars. Um, the mode of action is still not clear. Um, uh, we are more, doing more uh, research on that. And the recommended dose rate is minimum 0.1 to 5%. Um, and we have, haven't seen any differences between the different brands. So with this, I hope that to, to give you a bit more insight on the use of adjuvants and uh, sugar in, in uh, particular on the improvement and uh, optimization of uh, TRIPS control in practice. Thank you very much, Marcel. Uh, over to you, Liz, for the Q and A. Great, thank you. So, um, yeah, if everyone could put their questions in the Q and A, we've just got a couple in there at the moment. So, the first one uh, was from early on. Is it true that when you incorporate sugar with thrip chemical control, it can enhance thrips control? Well, I think I've proven that with my presentation. Uh, that indeed. Um, uh, if you we take mix the, this with uh, with the chemicals, that it works. Uh, we have also looked in the past to have premixes, so already built in, in into the formulation. But unfortunately, so far we didn't succeed uh, in that, and uh, that also brings limitations to the formulation because then it is not uh, working against other pests or diseases anymore. Thank you. And the second one we have is, what is the suitable nozzle size for thrips and the volume of spray per hectare? I know this is something we did talk about briefly in our previous webinar series back in August, but is there anyone, Victor, could you maybe help out here? Yeah, I think I'd want to refer Ezekiel to our website. There's a section called uh, the Learning Hub where we have a comprehensive presentation on uh, spray water volumes, as well as coverage. Uh, but just to bring you up to speed with what we discussed um, in that particular webinar, we advocated for the use of the air induction nozzles, which are actually anti-drift. So they minimize uh, drift and uh, they allow more deposition on the crop. 
But I think when we're using uh, hollow con nozzles, probably for most growers, what you'd consider to be discharging medium uh, size droplets, I think is a brown nozzle. But again, you can confirm from your manufacturer the type of nozzle that discharges a medium type of droplet sizes. Then in terms of water volumes, again, um, in that uh, particular webinar, we looked at uh, different spraying equipments. But uh, on average, most growers use between 1,000 and 1,500 uh, liters of water per hectare. Awesome. Thank you, Liz. So there aren't any more questions at the moment. Um, if people want to put them in, then now is your chance. If not, of course, you can get in touch with our local team. Um, over the next um, week or so, this webinar that was recorded will be uploaded online so you can watch it back and also share it with your teams and colleagues who weren't able to join. Okay, so I see uh, no further questions. So thank you very much for joining everybody. Um, I hope you've enjoyed the, the webinar. So thank you very much.